Thank you very much, Antonio, for those kind words. And I'd like to thank the Toronto Entomologists Association and the Hess family for the invitation to be here today. I'm particularly honoured to be recognizing Quimby for his contribution to the, uh, the butterfly world here in, in Canada. Um, unlike many of you, I didn't know Quimby Weller for long, but I did have a seminal meeting with him back when I was quite young, actually. Um, I actually started my butterfly in Ajax, just east of Toronto, as, as a young lad, seven years old. I remember chasing my first cabbage butterfly around a schoolyard and catching it in the cap. And it kind of went on from there, and I built a, a collection from that area. But then I got into my teen years, and you know what happens as a teenager, you get a little preoccupied with other things, and I kind of fell away from the butterfly world at that point. And, uh, but then I came to U of T in the late 1960s, and one of the early people I met there was one Quimby Hess. And Quimby actually invited me very kindly up to his house, and he took me down to the basement, showed me his collection, and we talked for a bit, and then we talked about exchanging some butterflies, and I did, and I came back up several times during that, I think it was my second year, uh, or third year university, and then um, after that I moved away from Toronto, and I never actually met Quimby again after that. But he played an absolutely pivotal role in reinvigorating my interest in butterflies, and to this day I, I thank Quimby for doing that. So this is partially for me too, an, an opportunity to say a belated thank you to Quimby Hess and, and to his family. So I guess I should uh, well, get on with the talk then, and we're calling this set the on the wing. Now, back uh, from 2004 to 2006, I, as mentioned by Antonia, um, was made a, a director of a center in, in the UK and England uh, that specialized in biodiversity data. But while I was there, I wanted to make sure I got around the UK to see butterflies. And I didn't know much about butterflies in the UK. I had a few books, uh, as people do. But one of the first things I did, and I lived in a small area down where that bump is at the bottom, near Ames in Cambridge, near uh, in East Anglia. And there was a little woodland near there that had, I was told, had something called the Purple Emperor Butterfly, which I always wanted to see when I was a kid. So I thought, oh, okay, I'll go up there and look for a Purple Emperor. Well, lo and behold, I showed up in this woodlot. There was at least a hundred other people in it looking for the Purple Emperor. <laughs> which was a bit... Um, in daunting at first, but then I quickly found out that these people were so active and had been at it for so many years that they simply built data over time. And that data, they transferred and produced this millennium atlas of butterflies in Britain and Ireland. Now this sort of looks like a report, but you have to see a copy of this thing. It's, it's like a doorstop. It's about an inch thick, it's about that big, and it has reams and reams of data and minute distribution maps for all species in the UK. And as I said, it's that thick. But there we have 59 resident and regular immigrant butterflies. I thought that was a testament to the observational role of naturalists in the UK. So uh, when I came back from England, um, I thought, well, why don't we have something like that for Canada? But, but we hadn't. Um, and I identified a need that I basically said was an overview, like an overall assessment, and analyzing just how healthy are our butterfly populations here in Canada and the ecosystems that they have to have um, to live in. So that was my ideal. And very luckily and fortunately, we have here in Canada a number of organizations whose job it is is to amass data on species at risk, conservation species, and, and all species, some of them. And then um, to do reports based on these so that they see which ones need protection and which ones don't. So we have NatureServe Canada in the bottom here. Um, that's a, a large NGO made up of uh, conservation data centers in all of the uh, jurisdictions across the country. And they amass data on species of conservation concern. They've got a ton of data uh, available that you can do distribution maps from the thing. So there's NatureServe, but there's another organization called Wild Species. I don't know how many of you are familiar, but they do a general status of species Canada periodically, and they've done them for birds and mammals, um, they've done dry but they also did butterflies, and the first time they did it was in the year 2000, so they came up with a list of all butterflies in Canada, and they then assigned a rank to their conservation status. They redid that again in 2010, um, the actual detail isn't available, but I do, and I will show you later some of the overviews that they have of which species are at risk, and then based on those kind of rankings and everything, you have Seaway, 
the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. And Kosiewicz is the one that then looks at that and says, okay, we have certain species that could be at risk, and so they do detailed reports on them. And they get people to actually write up these reports and then submit them to Kosiewicz, who puts them forward as possible for putting on the Species at Risk Act to give them federal legislation. Uh, and then it's the Parliament of Canada who decide what gets saved and what doesn't. So all of that data was sitting there, but it had never been overall analyzed um, as I intended to do. So I approached one of them, Nature Serve Canada, uh, and they agreed to publish this report if I would take the time to write it. So it took about two years, and it came out in 2009, called it Sentinels on the Wing, and it basically covered the, the status and conservation of butterflies in Canada. And it is available, by the way, freely on the internet at the, uh, the webmail address you see at the bottom, www.natureshare.ca. So, I uh, produced this thing, and how did I go about it? I guess what I tried to do was ask myself some, what seemed like fairly basic questions, but didn't necessarily obviously have obvious, easy answers. And the very first one is trying to convince the public, why should we care about butterflies? I know why I care about butterflies. I'm out there looking at them, you know, most months of the year, except winter, of course. And I know you folks are, because you're here, and you belong to associations like the Toronto Entomologist Association, but what about the general public? What do they, uh, why should they care about butterflies? Well, yes, they are beautiful. They are the um, sort of the Hollywood celebrities of the, the insect set. And uh, here we have uh, Brad Pitt and uh, Angelina Jolie. <laughs> so, sorry, we, we have an eastern tiger swallowtail on the left, which is this big, huge, beautiful yellow tiger shirt thing, and the white admiral butterfly on the right. And those two ladies at the top were two of members of a, an excursion I took out in the Ottawa area. We were walking down this woodland path, and this very white admiral landed on picturesquely on these ferns in front of us, so they were madly snapping away, and I walked in when they finished and caught this shot. So butterflies are beautiful. They're charismatic. People like them. But they're much more than that. Butterflies are also major pollinators. Um, a lot of our crops, like uh, clover crops, legume type of crops, depend on butterflies and other things. Now, they're not quite in the same category as bees might be, or some of the fly groups, like the hoverflies, flowerflies. Uh, but they do get around flowers and they visit them. But then the question becomes, well, why would butterflies be attracted to certain flowers and not others? And this is a bit representative. Just quickly, I'll go through the little Delaware skipper on the top. And by the way, I don't know if you can see it, but can you see its proboscis stuck out and down in? The proboscis is almost twice as long as the body. But what they do is they dip this thing into each of those little florets and draw the nectar out. So one, you have to have nectar, and they like um, particularly flowering plants that have a lot of nectar. Milkweed on the upper right with the Baltimore checker spot. It's, it's my favorite and their favorite um, nectar resource by far, I think, in Ontario. And I also threw in a picture of uh, a rare little butterfly, I'll talk more about it later, called the Gorgon checker spot, but here it is on a black-eyed Susan sipping up the nectar. So they do do a lot of pollination. They also play a major role in uh, natural food systems. Um, this black swallowtail caterpillar that you see on the left, I took in my backyard. I, I always put a pot of parsley, two pots of parsley in the backyard every spring. My wife uses one to, tri to trim and bring in. I use the other one to attract the black swallowtail. Every single year, for 30 years in Ottawa, a black swallowtail female has laid eggs on one of these things. So they're nice and easy to take a snap of. But keep in mind, caterpillars are simply food-eating machines. All they do is funnel in the, the, the plant at the front and out it goes at the other end. Maybe they live about two weeks, the shortest. Some of them live a couple of years in the far north of Canada, but they're herbivores. They just eat, except a few exceptions, which I won't bore you with. But butterflies in all of their life stages also form a major food source for other predators. Um, and that ranges from birds right down through this robber fly that's nabbed himself, a uh, poor little northern crescent, and he just sucks the juices out of it, sucks it dry. Uh, right down to bacteria, which will prey on, on uh, pygmy larvae. And so butterflies are part of this natural food system. But what I really wanted to focus on today was to talk to you about what I call the butterfly in the mine. Um, you will all probably be familiar with the story about back in the mining days in Europe when miners went down into particularly coal mines, there was always the fear of trapped gases down there that might kill them because they can't breathe and there'd be no oxygen. And so they always took down a little canary cage with a canary in it, 
theory being that the canary was much smaller bodied and if there are noxious gases, if it fell off its perch, they knew it was time to get out of there very quickly. And they actually did that and they did it for centuries. So that was an early warning that there was a problem. To my mind, butterflies are an early warning that there may be a problem with our ecosystems and our environments. I particularly show this species. This is a, a beautiful one found around the whole Arctic and in the northern hemispheres. We have it here in Canada. We call it the Old World Swallowtail up in the North Boreal Forest. But in England, they uh, have a subspecies called Britannicus found just there. And it was only found in the area where I lived in England, where they had these it used to be a big, huge fen area. Well, they drained that in the 17th century. And after they drained it, they found fairly quickly that a lot of species disappeared. So it dried up and they turned it to agriculture. Not conducive to this butterfly or a lot of other wildlife. Um, so back about 100 years ago, people started saying, whoa, whoa, there are almost no swallowtails left. And they're in big trouble. So we better help them. And so people actually started to recreate fen habitat. They started to plant in the milk parsley food plant for this thing. And now you can go out into these fens and the broads in Norfolk, and you can see dozens of them in a day. So it works. People, people care about these things, but we need to use them a little early warning for ourselves. So with that those kind of thinking and about early warning, I asked myself, it's like a joint question, but they're so tightly woven, I decided to throw them in this one. Why are butterflies distribution changing? And they are, and I'll be showing you that shortly. And why are about one quarter of Canadian butterflies at form, one form of risk right now, according to all those assessments that were done by all of those organizations? So these are some numbers here. Don't worry about them specifically. But the point that they raise is that on all of these uh, various categories of risk, from extinct, extirpated, extinct, gone, right up through to secure number four, and then there's some sort of undetermined ones and accidentals that they don't count in those numbers. But you'll see that close to about one quarter are considered as less than secure. Okay, So that's what I was focusing on here. Which species and, and why? And these are the factors that I explored. And the first one being natural losses. All living beings die, and something naturally will kill everything. Um, so I, I will just touch on that briefly, but what I want to focus on is, are those human-related activities. So we looked at, um, I looked at habitat loss, and I'll give you a couple of examples in forest and grasslands in Ontario. I'll focus mostly on Ontario butterflies here. Um, habitat alterations, not just destroying it, but altering it enough that butterflies didn't find it a, a user-friendly place to be. You need to talk about invasive species, and that includes both butter, uh, butterflies and plants. I will touch on climate change. It's the up and growing concern for all wild species in the world right now is what effect does climate change have on them in the distribution. Pesticide use, you use pesticides, it kills butterflies and other insects. And finally, a couple of human uses, because people do raise them, and I just wanted to touch 